That's good. Um, okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back after the summer. So I hope you all had uh, great summers. And um, for those of you who are new to this, uh, welcome. We're happy that you're here. And um, for those of you who are returning um, and have been to other lectures, thank you for, for coming back. We're not sure why you do, but we're thankful that you do. <laughs> it's been pretty boring. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, uh, just to introduce myself real quickly, uh, my name's Dr. Michael Artime. I'm a visiting um, assistant professor of political science at Pacific Lutheran University, and this is my friend Mike. I'm Mike Purdy. I am a presidential historian in Seattle, and um, I've got a cool website. If you haven't already taken a look at it, presidentialhistory.com. Got a blog there. You can sign up for a free email subscription to it if you're interested. And there's a lot of good resources about the 2016 campaign on their links that you can go to, um, as well as all of the lectures that Michael and I have been doing um, are all recorded. And this one is being uh, videoed as well, so that will be up uh, in probably a couple of days, hopefully. So what are we going to do tonight? Um, we're going to try to make sense out of what's been going on. Don't know whether we'll be able to do that. Um, so this is our agenda. Uh, we want to kind of just recap what uh, some of the big events have been, uh, the conventions, the vice presidential picks, um, and then looking forward, thinking about the debates coming up. What kinds of things should we be looking for? Um, think about what are the campaign strategies of the two candidates. Um, we'll comment a little bit about media and the candidates and how that is working. And then we'll spend some time on um, October surprises, um, what might happen that could totally upset uh, the race in October or in September still. And then we'll look at voting uh, and what we're really interested in, what's happening with the polls and where are the candidates in the polls right now. But of course, before we get there... <laughs> So um, these are all from history, because uh, you've read about all the current stuff. <laughs> a selfish, spoiled brat. Who said it, and who did they say it about? These are all presidents talking about other presidents. Any guesses? So this was Richard Nixon talking about Bill Clinton. <laughs> Or narrow intelligence. <laughs> Somebody said this president had narrow intelligence. And it was Franklin Pierce talking about Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Lincoln, really? Interesting. A bungalow mind. <laughs> so when you get frustrated with your friends, you know, you can say, oh, you've got a bungalow mind. <laughs> so this one was um, Woodrow Wilson talking about Warren Harding. And then finally, a little runt. <laughs> Very presidential thing, so to think. So this one was uh, Theodore Roosevelt talking about Benjamin Harrison. Okay, let's get into the conventions. So there are really four main goals that we could say that the parties have on the conventions. And I get these goals from uh, Dr. David Dompke at the University of Washington. He kind of uh, framed those. So a clear message, uh, there's a unified party, uh, some impressive stagecraft, just how does the um, convention look and feel, and then some impressive uh, media breakthrough moments. So how did it happen? So the Republicans, interestingly, when we think about the clear message uh, for both parties, we, they want the message to be both pro-candidate and anti their opponent. Okay, So on the Republican side, it was interesting that there was really very little pro-Trump. Um, there was a lot about the slogan, Make America Great Again, and there was a lot of bashing of Hillary Clinton, lock her up, um, how to prosecute her. On the Democratic side, um, you know, Clinton was, was saying, you know, she's a fighter, she's with people, uh, we're stronger together, um, and the anti-message that Trump is temperamentally unfit to be president. From a party unification perspective, um, on the Republican side, it was interesting because many key Republican leaders uh, boycotted the convention. Uh, they said they're not going to go. Um, 
and, and there were a number of rules fights before the convention between the establishment portion of the party and some of the never Trump folks. And of course that didn't end up uh, changing who the nominee was. And then very interestingly, Donald Trump ended up criticizing Ohio Governor John Kasich. And this is surprising. Um, Kasich, of course, refused to endorse Trump. He still has not endorsed Trump. Uh, it says he probably won't. Um, but here is Trump criticizing the sitting Ohio governor, who's fairly popular in the state, and no Republican has ever won Ohio with, won the presidency without winning Ohio. So um, don't know what kind of a strategy that was. <laughs> And then also from a party unification perspective, we've got uh, Ted Cruz's speech where uh, he gets up there and he refuses to endorse Trump. He says, vote your conscience, which gets lots of people really riled up. The Democratic Party had their own issues with party unification with uh, Bernie Sanders supporters not really being on board, um, still resisting the inevitable. And uh, so they were slow to come around. And then, of course, just before the convention, you had the leaked emails of the Democratic National Committee that showed that the DNC had been providing um, favoritism toward Clinton uh, and the resignation of the DNC chair. On the positive side, uh, in terms of party unification, um, all the heavy hitters came out uh, supporting uh, Hillary Clinton very strongly. You have Barack. Michelle Obama speaking, Joe Biden, uh, Bill Clinton, Michael Bloomberg. Uh, so everybody kind of got in line uh, behind her. Bernie, Sa Bernie Sanders spoke. So let's talk about the stagecraft. Um, the GOP level, uh, they, they had more problems than the Democratic Convention, which was a fairly well-run convention. But on the Democratic or Republican side, uh, some speeches were late. There was uh, order of speakers that was sometimes problematic, uh, half-empty hall. Trump's rollout of his vice presidential pick was awkward, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but on the positive side, you know, um, Trump in um, introducing Melania to give her speech, you know, th th there's the, the fog that rises up and the silhouette of Trump coming on stage. So that's impressive stagecraft. Um, and, and then Trump actually, regardless of what we think about what he said, um, he delivered his speech well. He used a teleprompter, uh, but he didn't just read from it. He did uh, deliver it well. Media breakthrough moments, not always the kind of breakthrough moments that uh, candidates want or parties want. So Melania Trump's speech initially was thought to be fairly good until it was found that she had lifted a couple of paragraphs from Michelle Obama's speech. Um, Ted Cruz, a lot of media attention to his vote your conscience statement. Again, not exactly the kind of um, media attention that the party would want. On the Democratic side, you know, there were some um, interruptions of the proceedings with Bernie Sanders supporters uh, chanting. Um, you had Mr. Khan, Mr. and Mrs. Khan, who were up there, and he says, you know, has Trump ever read the Constitution? And, of course, the big uproar afterwards where um, Trump goes and attacks them. So that got a lot of media um, moments there. But the big thing that happened was the hug. And, and so this is after um, Obama gives his uh, speech uh, supporting Hillary Clinton and... Um, Afterwards, Clinton comes out on the stage, and uh, they hug. There's this genuine affection between the two, and, and that's an impressive media moment. Um, Clinton ended up getting more of a bump in the polls than uh, Trump did after the convention, and um, Michael's going to talk a little bit later on about the polling and where we're at with that and how that has um, developed. So I want to think about the uh, vice presidential picks. So you remember I told you a while ago that in uh, mid-May I was on a uh, CNN uh, live interview on who did I think would be picked for uh, vice presidents. I got it wrong. Uh, you know, I said the Democrats, uh, Hillary would pick, pick Sherrod Brown of Ohio and Trump would pick Newt Gingrich. Um, and that obviously did not happen. Although I think that if 
Trump's then campaign manager, Paul Manafort, had not been so insistent, I think Trump would have picked Gingrich or Chris Christie. Um, you see Manafort's hands uh, significantly on the decision to pick Pence um, as a way to get some of the establishment, conservative, Tea Party Republicans to come in line behind Trump. And I think that's part of what um, uh, went into that selection. It is kind of an interesting pick. They're, they're, uh, Trump and Pence are a real odd couple in many ways. Um, Personality-wise, they're totally different. Okay? Um, they're different on policy positions, on, on trade, on the Muslim ban, on the Iraq war. Um, very different. Pence comes in with a very high unfavorability ratings, um, you know, probably the highest since 1976. He's a known quantity, and people who know about him um, had very negative impacts. So he is very conservative, a Tea Party conservative, and he doesn't bring any geographic advantage to Trump. He brings Indiana, okay? Indiana is going to go Republican, probably. Uh, so it doesn't really help him very much. On the Democratic side, you know, Hillary Clinton um, got to pick second. You know, Pence was picked first. So Hillary could uh, gauge what's a good choice. Um, and she went with the safe route. Clinton is a, um, a conservative person when it comes to things like that. So she picked Tim Kaine. Um, uh, Kaine brings a number of advantages. One of them, uh, strong Democratic Party ties, uh, a good personal relationship with Clinton. Um, he brings Virginia in terms of a key battleground state, so he's popular there. Uh, he speaks fluent Spanish, so uh, reaching out to the Latino population. And, um, but, but some criticism of, of Cain, the Sanders wing of the party says, you know, he's not um, progressive enough. And you've got uh, some concerns about some gifts that he accepted when he was governor of Virginia. Um, even though those were legal on, at the time, uh, those could be raised as concerns. The debates coming up. So September 26th, um, the, the first debate. This is going to be probably one of the most widely watched debates in history. Um, I've seen estimates of 100 million people. And what we have to remember is for many people, that first debate is going to be the first time that they start to really key in to the presidential race. So there could be upwards of 60 million people who a lot of this stuff is new, who haven't been following it like you and I have been following it. And so some of the things that the candidates say, they're going to have to maybe step back and make sure that the audience understands the background of what's going on. So we got uh, two debates in October, and then the one vice presidential debate as well. So debates end up being sometimes very significant moments. And I think in this election, I think in particular the first debate has the potential to be a very significant moment and to, um, to change the course of the election. And we'll talk about that in a second. But historically, what's happened? So we had 1960, the first um, presidential debate televised debate, Nixon and Kennedy, and we all know the story that, you know, um, Nixon goes in having just before he goes into the studio, bumped his knee again on the car door, and it's already been kind of infected. Uh, Nixon is not particularly charismatic. Uh, he's sweating profusely, um, and he looks ill at ease, okay? Kennedy, charismatic, youthful looking, full of vigor, although I think if the voters had known some of Kennedy's diseases, he had Addison's disease, which is a life-threatening disease, he had severe back problems, he was on painkillers and anti-anxiety medications. Um, so despite all of what it looked like in the background, there were some significant health issues. And, you know, I just want to maybe just set the context on um, Hillary Clinton's health. So. Um, Presidents and presidential candidates are not bionic. They're people. They get sick. Pneumonia is a treatable disease. Um, and, and it's important that we think about what are the actual facts of a situation. I do think it's important, especially in this election, 
that there be a rational discussion of the candidate's health because they are the two oldest candidates ever to run for president. Uh, Trump would be the oldest president, first inaugurated, he would be 70. Clinton would be the second oldest, just a little bit younger than Ronald Reagan. So debates are important. Uh, we can think back to the 1976 debate with uh, Jimmy Carter challenging Gerald Ford and Gerald Ford's huge gaffe. And he says, there is no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe and there never will be under a Ford administration. Causing the moderator to say, uh, excuse me, what did you just say? And he repeated himself. So that caused people to say, you know, Ford really is a nice man, but he doesn't have a grip on the office and the issues going on. Or in 1984, Ronald Reagan is running for re-election and people are concerned. He's 73 years old. He's an older man, and they're concerned, is he up for a second term? So the issue is raised at the debate about Reagan's age. And Reagan, um, a master of stagecraft and of humor, um, says this. He says, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I'm not going to exploit for political purposes the youth and inexperience of my opponent. <laughs> which brought the House down, including Walter Mondale, who cracked up. But that put an end to the age issue um, there. Or 19, um, uh, 1988, where you've got uh, the vice presidential debate, Dan Quayle and Lloyd Benson. And uh, Quayle is being criticized. He's 41 years old. He's being criticized for not having enough experience. And he's making the case, I have just as much experience as John F. Kennedy did when he became president. And Benson jumps on him with the famous words, um, Senator, I knew Jack Kennedy, and Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. And, um, and, and, and Quayle is just, you know, struck by, what do I say? And he just looks pale, and he says, that wasn't a nice thing to say. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's a debate, you know. <laughs> or in 1992, um, George H.W. Bush, trying to run for a second term against Bill Clinton. And during the debate, Bush looks down at his watch. Ooh, not a good move, OK? I, I just want to get out of here, OK? Um, or in uh, 2000, between uh, George W. Bush and Al Gore, uh, Gore, <sighs> big size while Bush is speaking, and then physically intruding on Bush's space. Not good moves. Uh, so, so, so these things, there are moments in debates. And, and so we'll, we'll look at what um, some things might be here. So we know that we're only going to have two candidates. Uh, Gary Johnson did not qualify for this debate. He did not uh, reach 15% in the polls. So it will be just Clinton and Trump. I think the debate format is going to favor Clinton because they're not going to have teleprompters. And we know that uh, when Trump is not behind a teleprompter, he says what he thinks. And, and, <laughs> and, and what he thinks often comes out uh, rather crude. Uh, so I, my, my sense is that it, it has a chance of uh, favoring Clinton. It's going to be a challenge for Trump. Let's talk about the debate preparation. What are they doing? Um, so it's interesting when we think about what, uh, what we hear about what they're doing it really plays into the narrative of what both campaigns are characterizing the candidates as. So the Clinton campaign characterizes Clinton as prepared, diligent, and Trump shoot from the hip. And that's in fact what we're hearing in terms of what they're doing on preparation. So Clinton has had more than 40 previous debates. She's experienced. She's reading lots of briefing books about Trump, about his style, his politics, She's watching videos of Trump, especially when he's on the attack. Um, and, and so she's really studying this. And I think she's going to uh, be prepared with some uh, good one-line zingers. She's going to know how to go on the attack. I think part of the, 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 her strategy, and we'll get into strategy in a minute, may be to try to bait Trump. Uh, but we'll talk about that. Trump, on the other hand, has fewer uh, debate experiences. He's never gone one-on-one -on -one against anyone. It's always been in the Republican field with multiple candidates, and he's never gone against just one woman. 
uh, which is going to be an issue for Trump as well, I think. Um, very informal. He's not reading briefing books. He doesn't particularly like to read. And uh, so he, he has said, I mean, I mean he, he said that, you know, he, he doesn't read. So I'm, I'm not making this up, you know. Um, he has said, I believe you can prep too much for those things. It can be dangerous. You can sound scripted or phony. He won't sound scripted. Um, like you're trying to be someone you're not. So let's think about what the strategy is going to be. So Trump's strategy, um, I think, is going to include a couple things. It's going to include big attacks um, on Hillary Clinton. Um, he's going to attack her health, saying she's, she's sick, she's not fit for the presidency. Um, she's going to say that she doesn't respect Americans. She calls them deplorable. So he's going to bring that up. Um, he's going to make a sexist comment and say she doesn't look very presidential. Uh, he's going to bring up the Clinton Foundation and try to turn that into a pay-for-play situation that people who um, made donations to the Clinton Foundation got extra access to Clinton when she was Secretary of State. He's going to bring up her judgment and, and the email situation. He's going to accuse her of wanting to abolish the Second Amendment and may bring up the Monica Lewinsky scandal. So these are things he may bring up in terms of part of his strategy. Other things that he may do, so we have to remember that Trump's main strategy in life is to counterpunch. So if anybody, whether it's Hillary Clinton or the moderator, says anything negative about him, he will immediately go and attack the person who said it. Not going to deal with the substance of that criticism, but he will attack that person. So the New York Times writes something negative about Trump, and what does he do? He says, oh, it's a failing newspaper, okay? Um, he also does what I call reverse attacks. So if he is called a bigot, which he has been called a bigot, he now comes out and says, well, Hillary Clinton is the biggest bigot of all. Or if he says, uh, if he's accused of um, not being temperamentally fit for the presidency in terms of uh, being commander-in-chief, um, uh, questioning his judgment, he then says, Hillary Clinton is trigger-happy, and she'll get us into a war. Despite the fact that Trump, uh, a week or so ago, said that if the Iranians made an obscene gesture to our uh, soldiers, that he would order uh, that they be shot. So you start a war over something like that. So I think we need to think about... Um, uh, Trump's mode of operation, this comes from his book, The Art of the Deal. Um, and, and so I think it's very illuminating. He says, the final key to way I promote is bravado. I play to people's fantasies. People may not always think big themselves, but they can still get very excited by those who do. That's why a little hyperbole never hurts, or a big hyperbole. Um, people want to believe something is the biggest and the greatest and the most spectacular. Now, Michael and I have tried to make these uh, lectures um, nonpartisan. You may uh, pick up in my comments uh, some uh, additional criticism of, Do of Donald Trump. And, and I think we need to, uh, there, there's been some things in the media that's been talked about um, called false equivalencies that the media tries to say, well, we have to treat them the same. Um, and, um, but, but, but none of us who are parents, we don't treat our kids the same. They're different people. And, and, and Trump and Clinton are in different universes. And I think we need to um, be honest about that, and we need to say that. So if I say more negative things about Trump, um, it's because I think they are in different universes. If I offend somebody, I'm sorry, but I, I think that's uh, the truth. Trump's other strategy is to try to create the narrative that he wants to be true, regardless of whether there's any factual basis for it. Um, and so he'll repeat it over and over, trying to make it sound true. But as Franklin Roosevelt said, repetition does not transform a lie into a truth. 
Clinton's strategy, I think, may in the debate be partially to try to bait Donald Trump um, into counterpunching and to have him look unpresidential. So Trump is insecure about his intelligence. He's insecure about his net worth and his um, you know, success as a businessman. So th those may be things that she zeroes in on, although recently uh, we've seen some movement with Hillary Clinton trying to offer a more positive vision, but we know some of the questions and some of the issues in the debates are going to get at negatives of the candidates. She is going to promote her experience and her plans, that she's got a steady temperament, that Trump is temperamentally unfit and he's a divider, and she may raise questions about why isn't Trump releasing his taxes. The interesting thing, if Trump is elected by law, uh, the president has to disclose all of their financial affairs, so he would have to do that then anyway. Clinton's strategy is going to try to, she's going to have to try to humanize herself. Um, by all accounts, Hillary Clinton is a very charming person one-on-one. -on -one. But when she gets in front of a microphone and an audience, she doesn't come across that way. So she's going to have to um, personalize herself, humanize herself, um, show some humility. Uh, th those are going to be important things for her. Uh, Trump is going to have to look presidential. Um, he's not going to have his teleprompter to rely upon. So when we think about uh, staffing strategy or staffing um, as campaign strategy, the, the Republican Party is significantly behind when it comes to staffing. So these numbers are as of late July, and the Clinton campaign had 710 paid staff, Trump campaign 72. You can look at similar statistics on the number of field offices, which is just dramatic, the number of field offices that Clinton has and the very few that Trump has. And in many ways, this election is going to be won by the candidate who can get their voters to the polls. Uh, it's the ground game. Uh, the, the demographics favor uh, Hillary Clinton. If Hillary Clinton can get her voters excited and to the polls, then Hillary Clinton will win. She does have a good ground game, but it's, uh, she, she has some, um, there are some issues. Uh, millennial voters are um, not as excited about Hillary Clinton. There's been some recent movement in the last couple days to try to uh, bring that group uh, on board. Clinton is outspending Trump significantly on uh, television ads. Trump is continuing to rely upon uh, rallies and free media exposure. And in many ways, this election um, is ending up becoming one that's a referendum on each of the candidates. Who is the worst candidate? Um, there's many people who don't like Clinton, many people who don't like Trump. Um, so I want to look historically at a couple of uh, cases of flawed candidates, very, very flawed candidates who won landslide elections against an even more flawed candidate. Okay? So if we go back to 1964, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson had some ethical problems. Um, truth wasn't, you know, his strongest suit. Um, he was crude. He was manipulative. If he wanted something from you, he would stand right close up to you with his face right in your face and grab you by your shirt collar and make you lean backwards. And he would, um, he would threaten you. He would sweet talk you. He would push to get his way. Um, but, but, but he was an uncultured, uncouth person from the, the hill country, the poor hill country of Texas. Um, and he never got over that. So if you were having dinner with Lyndon Johnson, it's a formal dinner, let's say, and, and the president is sitting uh, next to you or across from you, and he sees some food on your plate that he wants, he will just reach over and grab it. Not real couth. Um, he, he oftentimes would uh, meet with his staff to, you know, talk about issues and to give directions, um, but he did it while he was sitting on the toilet. Um, or the, the picture here is Johnson uh, pulling up his shirt and showing the reporters um, the scar from his gallbladder surgery. 
Um, and, and you talk about transparency and health issues, okay, you know. <laughs> but Johnson won a landslide victory against an even more flawed candidate, Barry Goldwater, who was a very fringe extremist candidate. Or you could look at 1972, Richard Nixon. Nixon was probably one of the most uh, awkward people ever to be president. Um, you know, he's got this forced body language. He tries too hard. He's paranoid about the media. He's ill at ease with people. People call him Tricky Dick. Um, he, he smears his foes with uh, innuendo, and, and he's also not particularly careful with the facts. But Nixon wins a landslide victory against an, a, another fringe extreme candidate on the Democratic side this time in George McGovern. So what do we have in 2016? So we've got um, Hillary Clinton, very, very knowledgeable, but not a good public speaker. Um, she is paranoid about the vast right-wing conspiracy. She's not real good with the media. We'll talk about the media in a minute. Um, some of her paranoia about the right wing is um, based on some facts. Um, and, and, and Clinton is somewhat blind, I think, to perception issues, to ethical issues. Uh, regardless of what we think, whether Hillary Clinton is a, a liar or tells the truth or whatever, um, if you were in Hillary Clinton's position, um, at, and she has been in the public eye for so long, you have to be squeaky clean. Um, and you have to realize that actions that you take as Secretary of State um, and you're planning to run for president may come out. I, I think the issue is that, that Clinton is so focused on doing the job and doing the job right that she's just kind of blind to how things get perceived sometimes. Donald Trump is a fringe extremist candidate, probably more uh, extremist than we've seen in 1964 or 1972. I would argue he's the most inexperienced person ever to run for the presidency. Um, he's a populist, he's a demagogue, um, and he has no moral or policy foundations. He will say um, anything uh, that he thinks is going to get him votes. Um, and he's obviously the, the one with the most um, unfiltered mouth uh, that, that, that we've ever seen. Uh, we, we, we've just never seen presidential politics uh, degrade to, um, you know, eighth grade schoolyard uh, fights. So other strategies. So we, we think about what's going on on the Republican Party side, and, and we have what, what I call the 2016 mugwumps. Anybody remember who the mugwumps were? So, so 1884, we talked about it before, James Blaine is running on the Republican ticket, and um, people are concerned about Blaine's ethics and Many people in the Republican Party bolt the party and support Democrat Grover Cleveland, which really probably is the tipping scale and gives Cleveland uh, the presidency. Uh, and so you've got this whole host of folks, uh, very significant people, who have said that they are either not endorsing Trump, um, they are voting for Clinton, um, they're not going to vote for either one, but people who have said never Trump. To this list, we could add um, some lists of uh, significant people. Fifty Republican national security experts have come out and called Trump a threat to global security and to American security. Or 600 historians who have come out against Trump. Or 40 Catholic uh, leaders who have come out. These are all formal letters, and I know there's more than just those. Those are the ones that I could think of. Um, so those could end up being significant. Let's talk about the media and the candidates. And I want to go back historically first. So in 1798, Congress passed and President John Adams signed what was called the Alien and Sedition Acts. These were actually four acts of Congress. Uh, the one we want to focus on here is the Sedition Act, which don't tell Donald Trump about it because he would love it. Um, it basically said that the government could um, uh, fine people or jail people who write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing about the government. Um, very unconstitutional, but at that point in time in 1798, the, the whole doctrine of 
judicial review of the constitutionality of acts of Congress hadn't happened. That didn't happen until 1803. So, um, and it's kind of a stain on John Adams' presidency. But so here is this um, relationship with the, the media saying, you know, don't say anything against the government or you go to jail. We can also look at Franklin Roosevelt, the total opposite. So here's a picture of Franklin Roosevelt um, in the Oval Office behind his desk holding one of his twice-weekly press conferences. And everybody's clamoring around. Roosevelt was fairly loose with what he said, but he had a couple of ground rules. He said that they could not quote him directly unless, he got, unless the media got that quote directly from his press secretary in writing. He said that some things were off the record, but he brought them into his confidence. He said that some things were... Um, uh, just background inf uh, information, they were not subject to attribution. Some things were totally confidential. He did not do any pre-screening of the questions. He let them, uh, unlike uh, previous presidents, Coolidge and Hoover, who you know did pre-screening of the questions, Roosevelt took anything. And so what happened there, Roosevelt brings them into his orbit and has a great relationship with them. They never take pictures of him in his wheelchair. So most people didn't know he was paralyzed. There's only two pictures of Roosevelt in a wheelchair that we have. We could look at Lyndon Johnson and the press. He didn't like the press. He said he saw the press only from the open end of the gun barrel. That was his view of the press, and he said there's a serious imbalance in the reporting of the press. So very confrontational, Richard Nixon, very confrontational with the media. So what, what are the two current candidates doing? Well, um, up until very recently, Donald Trump had revoked press credentials for um, media like the Washington Post, who had written things that were critical of him, that he didn't agree with. He thought that they weren't nice. Um, he has since restored those uh, press credentials, but he continues at rallies to rail against the media, saying they're the most dishonest people around. It's really disgusting. Um, and, and here's a tweet from him. He says, It is not freedom of the press when newspapers and others are allowed to say and write whatever they want, even if it's completely false. I think that's what freedom of the press means. Uh, so, but, but, but this is uh, Trump's relationship with the media. Um, Hillary Clinton has some suspicions of the media as well and some, some problems there. Um, She's gone a long time without a press conference. She has begun having them recently, early September. Um, she made a major change. She got a new campaign plane, much bigger, and there's space for 40 uh, reporters. And so they now fly with her on the campaign. A couple of times she's gone back to the back compartment of the uh, aircraft and taken informal questions. She's had press conference on the tarmac, out, and this is what she's doing right here outside her plane. Um, so she's beginning to... Uh, I'm not sure I would say warm up to them, but she's uh, bringing them in a little bit more uh, because it is uh, very important how they characterize things. So let's talk about October surprises. Um, so historically, th this is a moment or moments in a campaign of something unexpected that might happen in October that totally changes the narrative of the race. Um, in 1968, uh, Lyndon Johnson announced the halt of bombing in North Vietnam as a way to try to tilt the election to his vice president, Hubert Humphrey. Or in 1972, Henry Kissinger said about Vietnam, peace is at hand, um, again, trying to help Nixon win re-election. And in 1980, Jimmy Carter was working fervently trying to get the Iranian hostages released. Of course, they were not until uh, the day of Reagan's inauguration. So what might be some October surprises that we might uh, see this year? And there, I'm sure we could add more to the list. So with respect to Hillary Clinton, is there a smoking gun in the 14,900 emails that the uh, State Department is going to be releasing in October? We don't know but we know that people will be scrutinizing those very carefully. WikiLeaks, 
discloses new emails. Now, they've actually promised that this is going to happen, that they have some emails, and they're going to be disclosing those. What are those going to mean? The moral of the story is be careful what you write in emails, okay? <laughs> Will there be congressional perjury hearings against Clinton? Did she lie to Congress um, when she testified about Benghazi? Are there going to be more things coming out about the Clinton Foundation and the State Department and the relationship, and was there a pay-for-play uh, situation involved there, which personally I don't think there was. Um, does Clinton say something deplorable? Um, this is a reference, of course, to her uh, comment uh, a few weeks ago saying that half of Trump's supporters belong to a basket of deplorables. And, and that has been uh, something that's caused Clinton's uh, poll numbers to drop. With respect to Donald Trump, October surprises. So things about his finances or his business practices get revealed. His tax returns get hacked or somehow get disclosed. And, and they reveal things about his relationship and investments in Russia or how much taxes he pays or um, what level of uh, charitable contributions he actually makes. There's more uh, disclosures or court issues about uh, Trump University and whether he really was bilking people um, of money in that scheme. Um, more connections about Trump with respect to Russia get exposed. Russia is very pro-Trump at this point. You watch uh, Russian television stations. It is incredible how uh, favorable to Trump they are. Um, he is still soliciting uh, campaign contributions from foreign countries, which is against the law, and does this end up becoming um, a bigger issue? Um, more Trump Foundation disclosures about, you know, pay for play, this thing with the uh, Attorney General in North Carolina, um, or other uh, things about the Trump Foundation. The New York Attorney General has said he's going to investigate the Trump Foundation more. Um, things come up about Melania Trump's immigration history that that show that maybe she was an illegal immigrant um, and, and got her citizenship uh, illegally. Trump withdraws from the race. <laughs> you know, stranger things have happened. This has been a crazy election. Um, I'm just trying to kind of think what might go on. Um, or the GOP decides they've had enough and they dump Trump. And there's actually... Uh, a method for the GOP to do that in their rules, uh, that they, they could uh, take that action. So let's look at some, uh, oh, or he says something outrageous, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't put that on surprise because that's really not a surprise, is it? <laughs> So let's look at some things that uh, might apply to both candidates that, that could impact the race. Um, there could be violence against one or both of the candidates, and Trump has said some things that uh, could be seen as inciting violence against Hillary Clinton. Um, there's more health disclosures or events, either Trump or Clinton, that, that uh, totally reshape the race. There's more computer hacking. The government can't, Congress can't figure out how to keep the government running, and there's a shutdown over the budget. Terrorist attacks. Well, we just saw this over the weekend. Okay, uh, Still to be seen and sorted out uh, the exact source of this, although uh, ISIS is claiming responsibility for the Minnesota stabbings. And so uh, we don't know for sure about the uh, New York and New Jersey things. But, but these things can um, have a big impact uh, especially in terms of how the candidates respond. There could be some major international crisis. Um, maybe there's a military confrontation with Iran. Things are pretty tense there. Iran is <clears throat> doing some uh, dive bombing with planes. Um, maybe North Korea you know, launches a nuclear attack. I, th these are things that are within the realm of possibility. We could have some economic collapse that totally changes things. 
uh, which kind of ties in very closely with uh, President Obama's approval rating. Uh, if Obama's approval rating tanks, that's not going to be good news for Hillary Clinton. So last week it was 53%. As of today, I just checked before the lecture, it's 51%. So these things fluctuate. Uh, that's a fairly good approval rating for a president um, at this point in his second term. And just going back to the violence issue, I mean, we remember we've seen violence in campaigns. 1912, Theodore Roosevelt attempted assassination. 1968, Robert F. Kennedy assassination. 1972, George Wallace attempted assassination. So another potential surprise, uh, you know, could be something happens with the um, third party. So we, we know that um, they're, they're not going to be in the debate. Uh, they could be on the debate uh, October 9th or October 19th, depending on uh, how they do in the polls. So this guy, Evan McMullen, he's running an independent campaign. Uh, he's on the ballot in um, 10 states with 76 electoral votes right now. He's um, on the, he has access to other states that um, have a write-in process with 169 electoral votes. Um, so one of the things that, and this gets more into the election, that we may speculate on, we, we don't think that um, Gary Johnson or Jill Stein are going to win any state. Um, so when we think about electoral votes, um, somebody is probably going to have 270, um, and somebody is not going to have 270. It is possible they could tie on electoral votes, however. Um, Evan McMullen uh, is from Utah. He's a Mormon. What happens if Mitt Romney endorses him, or if Romney endorses uh, Gary Johnson? Uh, how does that reshape the race? So those are some potential October surprises. Um, but we don't want to deal with surprises. We want to deal with reality. Michael's going to talk about reality. He's going to tell us some things about voting. He's going to look at polls. And he's going to tell us who's going to win. Right, Michael? <laughs> sure, but not directly. You'll have to find it hidden deep in what I say. So, all right. Oh, thanks. Okay, so... Um, in talking about voting, I wanted to start by um, talking about systemic issues related to voting, how we vote, the process of voting. Um, in the next lecture, I'll talk um, a little bit more about how individual voters make up their mind about who to vote for. So how do, you know, what have we learned um, through political science studies about how people make decisions um, in terms of voting? So we'll cover that next time. Um, in terms of systemic issues, I wanted to start with um, registration um, issues. If you look at the dark green states, um, these are states which require um, strict photo identification. This has been um, a subject of a great deal of debate um, in a number of states. Um, the, the assumption is that states with strict photo identification are going to see a decrease in the number of uh, minority uh, poor and elderly voters. Um, so the assumption is that these individuals, these groups of individuals, are less likely to have photo identification um, than other groups. And so that is going to disproportionately affect those groups and, as a consequence, disproportionately affect the Democratic Party. Um, and so battles over photo identification have become very political, with um, Republicans in many state legislatures pushing um, for photo identification laws and Democrats pushing back um, against those laws. You also see um, those laws as the subject of a number of court cases throughout the United States. Um, so, for example, um, earlier this year, July 29th, um, 2016, um, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals um, ruled that um, North Carolina's 2013 photo identification law um, was unconstitutional. In that decision, they said that the legislature enacted one of the largest restrictions of the black voter franchise in modern North Carolina history. And so these are court decisions which are happening um, throughout the country. Um, we're going to have to see uh, what impact some of these laws have um, on turnout and, as a consequence, um, what impact they have on support uh, for either the Republican or the Democratic Party. Um, what, is, uh, what is important to note is that this could affect 
uh, voting in some important states. So states like Wisconsin, um, Virginia, even Georgia, where the vote right now is um, within four percentage points. Um, this could affect some important states. And so um, these systemic issues are something to pay attention to in addition to some of the larger narratives about policy issues or personal attacks, et cetera. Um, when thinking about uh, the Electoral College, um, uh, this is, is something I bring up because a lot of my students um, ask me about this. Why do we have this? Um, they have this because uh, the founders weren't um, all that excited about us making um, independent decisions. And I don't know, maybe 2016 gives them some, <laughs> some validity to their argument. Um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the students ask about whether the Electoral College should be changed, whether we could eliminate it and move to a national popular vote. Um, I'll just say that won't happen. I mean, we can't pass uh, Zika funding right now. I don't think that we're going to pass a, uh, an, uh, a constitutional amendment to change the way that voting um, is counted uh, in the United States. Um, there are things that can be done on a state level, though. So... Um, elect, uh, so states decide how their electors are going to be apportioned. So the only thing the federal government says is Washington state, you have X number of electors. Um, and so states like Maine and Nebraska, those are the two states um, that don't have a winner-take-all system. So they award uh, two votes uh, to the winner of that state's popular vote. Those are the two electoral votes given to them because they have um, two senators and then the rest of the electoral votes in those states are apportioned by congressional district, the winner of the popular vote in those individual congressional districts. Um, so states throughout the country could adopt, uh, could adopt that sort of uh, process. I don't think that's also very likely because, uh, you know, states want to have the maximum number of electoral votes going um, to the, the winner or the loser. That maximizes uh, the impact that they have on the electoral college outcome. So um, I don't see many states making a change there. Um, one interesting thing is that um, a number of states have gotten together and joined what's known as the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Uh, Washington State is one of those states. Uh, so there are 10 states, including the District of Columbia, which are part of this agreement right now. Um, and those 10 states, uh, if you combine them together with the District of Columbia, make up 165 electoral votes. Um, these states have agreed to when or if um, there are 270 electoral votes part of their, as part of their group, that they will all award their, uh, their popular vote, or they'll all award all of their electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote nationally. So once there are 270 votes enough to change the outcome in an election, who are part of this compact, then they would agree to that procedure, that it would automatically go into effect. I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon, necessarily. Pro the problem is, um, you know, while um, I have students that ask about this as a curiosity, um, there isn't a lot of, uh, there's no strong political movement that exists right now to put pressure on legislatures or on politicians to make, um, to make major changes to the way that we vote um, in the United States. Now, if we had another situation where the popular vote um, wasn't indicative of the electoral college outcome, maybe we see uh, a, another push for, for change in this process. The other question um, related to voting then is, what does it mean to win in the electoral college? Um, and what does it mean to win the popular vote? What does it mean to win the presidency? And so um, in, you know, in a handful of weeks, we're going to have somebody who wins the election, and that person will say, I have a mandate, meaning that Congress has an obligation to pass my policy agenda. And you will have members of Congress who say, that is not true. That is not what the election says, and I was not elected by the nation as a whole. I was elected by members of my district or members uh, of my state, and they want me to vote against everything that you want to do. And so um, what is likely the case is that uh, we are going to uh, maintain this, uh, this very deeply divided political process that we have right now, and it's going to be pretty difficult um, to get things done. Um, and so, you know, if you're looking for a reason to be pessimistic, there you go. Um, if we think about um, third-party candidates... Um, the last time we had a third-party candidate um, win any electoral college votes was in 19, 
1968 with George Wallace running as part of the American Independent Party, a party that was very much um, built on, um, on pushing for segregation throughout the United States. Um, and, and he won 46 electoral votes. Um, the strategy of the Wallace campaign was to win enough electoral votes to push the, uh, push the election into the House of Representatives where each state um, gets one vote. Um, that didn't end up happening. He didn't get enough electoral votes to, to make that happen. But that's the last time that we've had a third party candidate win, um, win any votes. Um, but if you're looking for similarities between now and 1968, there's a number of people who have, have looked back at this election, and, and in particular, some of the racial animosity that existed during the 1968 election, and have drawn parallels between what we're seeing in 2016. One example is, is you know, in this campaign button here, where George Wallace is campaigning as the law and order candidate. We've heard Donald Trump use that same language. Um, law and order is a phrase which has been used in American political history um, to essentially say that we need protection from some other. It's, it's, it's racially coded language that we've, we've heard um, in American politics in the past. And so um, that, is, that is reminiscent of, of what we saw in 1968. Um, George Wallace has said, it's a sad day in this country when you can't talk about law and order unless they want to call you a racist. Again, um, sort of um, you know, arguing against a push toward pol political correctness um, in, in 1968. So there are, there are certainly some parallels there. Um, Mike was talking about the conventions and whether the conventions were successful or not. If we look at the polling um, data after the conventions, um, so the GOP convention was between um, July 18th and 21st. And what you'll see is that in that period, you'll see that little spike. Um, the red spike is um, Trump's approval rating, and you can see that that um, increased uh, slightly after that period. Um, but it was pretty short-lived. Basically, it, it stayed that way until the start of the Democratic National Convention, which was uh, July 25th through 28th. Um, and so after that, you saw a major uptick in Hillary Clinton's uh, support. Okay. And um, a lot of people started talking about, um, what if she maintains this lead? This isn't going to be close. Um, this is going to be a, you know, a landslide. It's not going to be a close election. And um, people started drawing historical parallels. Things like FDR in 1936 won 99% of the electoral college vote. LBJ in 1964 won over 90% of the electoral college vote. Nixon, 97% of the electoral college vote in 1972. Reagan in 84 won almost 98% of the electoral college vote. Um, that is not going to happen. Um, you know, that, you know, even, even if you are the most optimistic Democratic voter, um, I would urge you not to, not to believe um, the landslide talk. That's, that's something that's not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because we're a much more divided country um, than, we were, than we once were. So this is just uh, data tracking um, opinions from 1994 through 2016. So you can see that the Republican Party attitudes about the Democratic Party. So um, in 1994, 21% of Republicans had a very unfavorable view of the Democratic Party. Um, 2016, it's 58%. Democratic attitudes toward the Republican Party. 17% of Democrats had negative attitudes about the Republican Party in 19, uh, 1994. Uh, now, 55% of Democrats have very unfavorable attitudes toward the Republican Party. So it's not just dislike, it's very unfavorable. You know, this is, this is a sign that, that we as a country are not going to uh, rally around any candidate in an election um, in a way that produces outcomes um, in those past landslides. That's just, that's something that's not going to happen. So if we look at where we're at in terms of polling, this is uh, polling data from today. Um, so right now, um, in a race just between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, um, it's, a, it's less than a point separating them. So 0.9 um, of a percentage point. Okay, so 44.9 to 44. If you include um, Gary Johnson and Jill Stein in that analysis, the race gets even closer. It's 0.7. Um, so 41 to 40.3 percentage points. Okay. And I was talking just a minute ago about how Hillary Clinton saw 
a major uptick in her support after the conventions. Um, but that, that's, that increase in support was rather short-lived. Um, so there was this initial uptick. Um, Nate Silver's website, 538.com, you know, analyzed uh, her polling data as of August 14th and then checked back in on August 31st. Um, in that two-week period, in nine of the 14 states, Hillary Clinton's lead was either cut in half or her lead went to Donald Trump. So that, that bounce didn't, didn't last for a particularly long time. Um, Real Clear Politics, uh, this is their electoral map right now. They say that the race is uh, 200 electoral votes uh, solidly in the Clinton-Cain camp, 164 electoral votes uh, solidly in the Trump-Pence uh, camp, which leaves 174 electoral votes up for grabs. So I could read each of these states, but I'm going to talk about them more specifically. So this is the data as of today and a number of um, the, battleground, the battleground states, as real clear politics identifies them as swing states. So if we just take that polling data that I just showed you, where those states are at this present moment, this is the outcome of the election. Okay. So Hillary Clinton and... Uh, Tim Kaine would win 293 electoral votes to 245. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not yet. <laughs> this is that same map last week. So Real Clear Politics has them losing 18 electoral votes since last week. So one of the exercises that I did was um, a couple weeks ago, I, I sat down and I thought, you know, what is the most optimistic scenario for Trump in terms of winning the election? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to give Hillary Clinton all of the states where she's up by at least five points right now. And then any close state in, in those battleground states, I'm going to give to Trump. If it's within, you know, a couple percentage points, I'm going to give those to Trump. Let's assume that this, this trend continues. Um, he keeps erasing her lead in those close states. Maybe all of them sort of fall in line, vote for Trump. Um, that, I think, is the best case scenario for him. Two weeks ago, this is that map. So 272 to 266. Last week, 259 to 279. This week, 250 to 288. So... If you were a Hillary Clinton supporter, this election is not moving in the direction that you're, uh, you're happy with. Okay. I, I still think that the, the path is really narrow for Trump, um, but it's a path I can see now, um, as opposed to earlier this summer when it was hard to imagine what that path would be. Um, again, this is from the spring. This is my map. It looks really, really off right now, but I'm going to stick with it because I'm an honest person. And, uh, you know, I, I, you can hold me to this. Uh, this is my map. Um, it is essentially the same map as we saw in 2012, only I gave North Carolina to, to Hillary. And that doesn't look so bad right now, but everything else may be a little more up in the air. Okay, so... I thought I'd cover some of the craziest bits of the news. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening. I just want to run through some things uh, really fast with you that I think are, are interesting. So, basket of deplorables. Mike talked about this. Um, you know, essentially Hillary Clinton said you've got uh, two groups uh, who are supporting Donald Trump. You've got economically disaffected um, people who, um, who are looking for some sort of... Um, change to the system. And then you have racists and the worst people you can imagine in the other camp. And she said that they were irredeemable. These were, these were beyond saving. Okay? Um, I, I think that it was probably not smart to say irredeemable. <laughs> you know, that's, that, 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 might be, that might be going a little far. And it might not have been the politically correct thing to say at that moment. Um, but I think that we have to also acknowledge that racism, 
and uh, bigoted attitudes have existed in this election. Um, I think to ignore her comment as, as a political gaffe um, ignores the fact that we have some really uh, important things to talk about in terms of of race and, and religion in this election. So I want to take you back um, to some analysis that I did earlier on in the lecture series. So essentially I created um, a couple of measures using the American National Election Studies data set. They have, um, they have some variables known as feeling thermometers. Um, so essentially you rate how warm or how cold you feel toward a group or a person or an institution. So if you rate someone as a zero, for example, you hate them, you want them to die. Um, if you rate someone as a hundred, like you want to marry that person, you couldn't imagine anything better than spending every day uh, with them. And so um, I created a racism scale where I just essentially um, said for everybody who participated in the study, let's subtract their, their feeling thermometer for whites and their feeling thermometer for blacks. And the difference there if it is a positive difference, that is a tendency toward, you know, perhaps racist attitudes. So you believe, at least to some degree, that whites are better than blacks, if you have a gap there, if there's a positive number. I did the same for Islamophobia, did the um, white feeling thermometer minus the Muslim feeling thermometer. If there's a positive gap there, that suggests that there is some you know, Islamophobia that exists within that respondent. Okay, so taking you back in time, um, Donald Trump scored higher, his, his supporters scored higher on this racism scale. They scored um, higher uh, at a rate of about six times the national average. And I can stop and in, in go in more detail on questions if you have them. Uh, for Islamophobia, it's over twice the national average um, for Donald Trump supporters. And if we move to just the basic question about Obama's religion, 66% of Donald Trump supporters in this study believe that Obama is a Muslim. Only about 33% say that he is not. And that feeds really well into the birther stuff um, that we just uh, heard the other day. So I do want to play this. This is only about 40 seconds, so... Um, you know, this is what Donald Trump said the other day. He was under some pressure by members of his, uh, his party and his own campaign staff um, wanting him to, uh, to say that Obama was born in the United States. Now, not to mention her in the same breath, but Hillary Clinton and her campaign of 2008 started the debirther controversy. I finished it. You know what I mean. President Barack Obama was born in the United States, period. Now we all want to get back to making America strong and great again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, again, uh, before I move on, I, I just want to say that this is an important, this, this controversy is important because it is an attempt to delegitimize the Americanness of Barack Obama saying that the nation's first black president wasn't born here, that he is somehow different or has different values than people in this country, and I think that that's particularly dangerous. Um, we can get into quibbles about, you know, what Hillary Clinton's staffer said in 2008 versus what Donald Trump said the last several years, but I think that this is an important issue. It's not a frivolous issue, that this um, speaks to some very difficult racial divides in this country that we have to address. Um, one of the statements that Donald Trump makes there is that he ended the birther controversy. The argument that, that the campaign is making is that he forced Obama to release the birth certificate. And so I just wanted to go through a, a few tweets here. Uh, you know, these are some of the things that Donald Trump has said over time. So in May 2012, he said, in his own words, Barack Obama was born in Kenya and raised in Indonesia and Hawaii. This statement was made. And he says, uh, in, uh, again in May of 2012, my uh, CNN interview with Wolf Blitzer where I discussed Barack Obama's birth certificate and why CNN has low ratings. So back to what Mike was saying about attack the media. Um, 
in July of 2012. I wonder what the answer is on Barack Obama's college application to the question, place of birth, question mark. Um, in, uh, in July as well, he said, congratulations to real Sheriff Joe, Joe Arpaio, um, who's that sheriff uh, who is very harsh on, on um, immigrants. Um, he says, uh, Sheriff Joe, on his successful cold case posse investigation, which claims Barack Obama's birth certificate is fake. And that's where things change. Right, so um, this didn't end with the release of the long form birth certificate. This continued. Uh, this continued into 2015, when there was still allegations that the birth certificate that was released was a fake. So in June of 2014, always remember, I was the one who got Obama to release his birth certificate, or whatever that was. Hillary couldn't. McCain couldn't. Or September uh, 2014. Attention all hackers, you are hacking everything, um, everything else, so please hack Obama's college records. Destroyed? Question mark. And check place of birth. Um, or in November of 2014, Obama also fabricated his own birth certificate after being pressured to produce one by Donald Trump. Okay. So I think this is an important conversation to have, um, and it's not, it's not a minor campaign issue. Um, Hillary Clinton fell and she was sick um, and so that raised a lot of questions um, about, about her health, about the degree to which we um, should know a about a president's health and I think that it raised some really good questions and some questions which were not so good. So reasonable questions, ways that we can approach this topic. Transparency, how much do we need to know about a candidate's health? There's also a question about how quickly her campaign should have responded to questions about what happened to her. It took a while for the campaign to respond. They weren't as transparent as they needed to be um, on this question. We should also ask questions about ableism. Do we have reasonable expectations about a candidate's health? Or are those expe uh, expectations unnecessarily disadvantaging those who do have physical limitations? So we talked about John Kennedy you know, who had to take lots of pictures that looked like he was running around with his children when he was in extreme back pain and on medication. Uh, we saw a picture uh, just a little bit ago, uh, FDR, um, who served, uh, a and a lot of people would say was, was a strong president, um, despite the fact that he was in a wheelchair. And so um, when we think about these questions, we should also ask, what are our expectations? Are they reasonable? Um, expectations for presidents. We should also ask questions about gender and to what extent gendered attitudes influence the way that we evaluate questions of health. Um, do we look at a woman who is 70 years old differently than we look at a man? Are we asking the same questions? I think these are things that we should, we should evaluate. What we should not be talking about is does Hillary Clinton have a body double? <laughs> or even worse, does she use pillows? So you can find websites where they just point at the pillow that she has propping her up as if without that pillow she would collapse. So don't ask those questions. Uh, last bit of news that I'll cover. Uh, Donald Trump got in trouble for doing um, an interview on Russian television with, uh, with Larry King. Um, it raised um, additional questions about the degree to which um, the Trump campaign and, you know, Russians are, are perhaps in cahoots or not, or to what degree there is uh, cooperation there. Donald Trump has said nice things about Putin. Putin has said nice things about uh, Donald Trump. Um, that's all fine. That, that's interesting. But the real thing that I wanted to get to here is that Mike did an interview with Russia Today, the same station that Donald Trump was on. And you can watch that interview on, on Mike's website. But I think that it's important now to admit that we... Uh, we are funded by the Russian government. Um, <laughs> disclosing, uh, disclosing our own. We want to be transparent. So Putin's awesome, by the way. So <laughs> what's going to happen now is that little portion is going to get taken out of this video online, and I'm going to get in all sorts of trouble. <laughs> Just a couple announcements uh, before we take questions. Um, you can read both Mike and I. You can read me on uh, politicscorrected.com. Mike on presidentialhistory.com. And I wanted to make a big, uh, a big announcement here. Um, so Mike and um, his wife Catherine are now uh, grandparents. This is the third Michael in the group now. Um, I assume that he is named after me. Uh, <laughs> that, that 
Mike's son really enjoyed the lecture series and things I had to say, so thanks. <laughs> um, you can also watch us uh, on election night. Mike and I are going to be um, analysts on KBTC uh, on election night, November 8th. Um, and uh, that Friday, following the election, um, we'll talk about the election results on Northwest Now um, on the same station. Um, also, before that, make sure that you come to the, the next lecture, which is going to be on October 25th, right here. 4th. 24th. 24th. Right. 25th is at PLU. Um, so if you miss that one, come to PLU, and we'll repeat the same, the same lecture, unless something dramatic happens in that 24-hour period, which it likely will. So, yeah. All right. Thanks. We're happy to answer questions. Questions? Yes. So why should you keep Donald Trump from just glaring over Hillary in the face and no one can control him and so he just comes across as a strong white man and she's a weak female? So the question is, what is to prevent Donald Trump during the debate to simply uh, raise his voice louder than Hil Hillary Clinton and just blare over her so she doesn't have a chance to say anything and he would have come across as a strong person and Clinton as a weak woman. Well, I mean, we hope that uh, the moderators are going to be able to keep control. We don't know whether that's going to happen. I mean, my solution is, you know, just pull the plug on the microphones, you know. But um, we're going to see some fireworks. Um, but that, that's a very good question in terms of how that's going to play out. Yeah, don't know. Yes, back. So the question relates to the accuracy of the polls, and particularly are they reflective of Hillary Clinton's strong minority support? Yeah, so most polls will use um, what's known as like a likely voter model or a likely voter screen. Um, so they are trying to um, create a microcosm of the voting population in the state or the country, meaning that they have, you know, if they predict that 30% of the voters in a given area are going to be black voters or 30, you know, 20% are going to be Latino voters. That's, uh, those, that's the percentage that should also be reflected within, um, within the poll itself. Now the question, oh, sorry, go ahead. How do they reach them? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so by telephone um, primarily um, is still the most common way. Of, of reaching voters. Uh, if you can't reach the number of voters that you need to, then you might have to do waiting. So you might have to, for example, if you, if you have less minority voters than your likely voter model would, um, would require, then you might have to wait the responses of, um, of minority voters in your sample. Um, there's also a question, I think the big question is um, how do you come up with these likely voter models? Um, so different news uh, organizations have very different likely voter models. There was a really surprise poll um, a little while back that had Donald Trump ahead, and um, pretty quickly people were um, critiquing that poll for uh, having a likely voter screen that included a um, large number of white, uh, white men without, college without a college education. And so you know, that sort of Trump's sweet spot in terms of the demographic um, characteristics, and so it wasn't it wasn't very surprising that given that likely voter model that you would achieve that result. That that likely voter model may be right, but that's why you arrive at that result, and that's why some polls might look differently. And, and certainly, we know that uh, polls are imprecise. So Gallup poll is not doing polling on the presidential election this year because they don't think they've got the model right. Things are changing uh, societally. So. Um, Yes.
So the question relates to the fact that uh, when you add in Gary Johnson and Jill Stein into the polls, that it appears Hillary Clinton loses more support. Um, and, and is that really an accurate thing? And, and, and then secondly, how can the um, people who are leaning toward uh, Johnson and Stein be encouraged to think about their vote uh, and not just be a, a protest vote? Yeah, I mean, it, um, I think that, you know, in my mind, it comes down to, you know, how people view their vote. And that's something that we'll talk about next time. Um, if you view, view your vote as like a statement about what you believe politically, then it makes, it makes all the sense in the world to vote for a third party candidate. And it would be hard to dissuade somebody not to vote for that candidate if they believe that that's the right thing to do and their only obligation is to vote their conscience. Um, others vote strategically. And so if you think about your vote as your way of producing the, the best outcome in a given situation, and you're thinking strategically about how your vote is going to interact with other votes that are cast, then it's difficult to make the argument that you should vote for a third party candidate. Um, and so I, I, I think that you know, a number of people um, who are voting for third party candidates um, are pretty sophisticated voters. Because in order to get to that decision, you have to have examined the two major party candidates and found them unappealing and then move to a third party candidate. And that's a level of sophistication that we don't see from, from lots of voters. So I would say it'd be pretty hard to dissuade somebody. Um, now there's a question is, as we get closer to election day, do some of those Johnson supporters or some of those Stein supporters, do they start to get cold feet as they think about what a Trump presidency might look like? Um, but I think that... Um, you know, it, it's, it's not a lack of knowledge. Um, I think that, if anything, they might be more informed than a lot of voters. Yes? I was watching an interview with um, attorney Alan Dershowitz, and he just wrote a book called Electile Dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, you know, all the models you're using might go out the window this time. Mm -hmm. Because he was talking about those people voting for Trump are voting for Trump because they don't want Hillary elected. Mm -hmm. and the people voting for Hillary are voting for her because they don't want Trump elected. And he was talking about there's not a lot of enthusiasm for Hillary or Trump mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a positive sense. So, sure. so the, the, the question relates to the fact that both Trump and Clinton are historically unpopular candidates. They both have very high unfavorability ratings and one author positing that uh, Trump supporters are voting uh, for him because they don't want Clinton and Clinton supporters are voting uh, um, well, you get get the drift there. <laughs> and and, and um, yeah. Michael, come on. Um, I, I think that you know certainly questions about uh, the voter, the likely voter models, I mean the, they're complicated questions, they could be very wrong this time and they could produce um, they could produce results that we don't anticipate. What I would say is so far, um, the narrative of 2016 has been crazy. Um, the data has not been crazy. Like if we're looking at primaries, you know, Donald Trump, you know, if he was any other candidate and we looked at, you know, what was happening in the Republican primary, we would have said throughout that he had a very good chance. It was our narrative about 2016 and our belief about voters um, that caused us to think that he didn't have a chance. Um, Hillary Clinton didn't have, you know, the, the, de the 2016 Democratic primary went about how you would anticipate it going. I mean, um, Bernie Sanders might have done better than um, you expected, but, but the data by and large was, was right throughout. Um, and so I think before I go as far as saying that everything is thrown out the window, I would have to see some results which really, you know, buck the conventional wisdom, at least in terms of data, not just in terms of narrative, if that makes sense. The narrative is crazy and doesn't make any sense. But the data, if we were just looking at candidate X versus candidate Y, then the data is not that far off. I think. Anything over here, <laughs> this section, Jack? Um, if Trump attacks Hillary's health, does it 
benefit Hillary at all, or will she attack the question of Trump's health? Because he's also an old man. His health is astonishingly excellent. Yeah, so, <laughs> so if uh, Trump attacks Hillary's health during the debate, is she going to turn around and attack his health in the debate? Um, she could raise questions about the um, completeness of the uh, medical records that Trump has released, which uh, have not been very complete and have, are full of hyperbole. Um, so, so that could happen. Um, you know, my sense is she probably wouldn't. I think she's going to work more at um, having a good answer about her health and then moving on to positives about what she's going to do. That's my sense. Yeah, I think it would be kind of... Um, I think any moment in the debate where she is not showing that she has a greater understanding of policy is a missed moment. You don't... I think that if you learn anything from the Republican primary debates, it's that you don't want to get down in the mud with Donald Trump. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question relates to, um, there are, I think it's one group in particular, one uh, mm -hmm. website, I don't think it's the major parts of the media. S Slate. Slate, who mm -hmm. have said that they are going to begin to release election results in real time. So that means people um, will be hearing what's really happening, um, election results uh, on the East Coast before we've even voted. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm kind of mixed on that. Like, I think that it's, um, I, I get reasons why people would be cautious. I also understand Sasha Eisenberg is the one who's running this um, study. He's somebody that that I respect in terms of the way that he understands, um, he understands voting, he understands elections. Um, but uh, you know, I understand his argument that we have so many polls leading up to these moments that, you know, it seems kind of arbitrary to say, oh, oh, midnight, no more. Um, that we're already operating with loads and loads of information about polling data and things like that, so what's the consequence of having more information? So I guess I get, I get both arguments um, there, and so I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Also, because it's just one site, um, I doubt that there's going to be that many people who are following that. And if you are following Slate's coverage of that, then you are probably a very sophisticated voter who has made up their mind already. So the question is, since uh, Gary Johnson doesn't like Donald Trump, will Johnson withdraw from the race before the election? Um, Let's add that to October surprises. <laughs> <laughs> Could happen, yeah. Or like I said earlier, Mitt Romney may endorse Johnson. And what does that do um, in terms of legitimizing his candidacy? One thing that you might see, oh, sorry, just no, to tack on there. Um, it, might, it, it probably wouldn't make sense for them because as, as the Libertarian Party, you're interested not just in this election, but elections moving forward. If the Libertarian Party gets 5% of the popular vote in this election, then they're eligible for federal matching funds under the campaign finance system. So even 5% even in the popular vote, um, and, and he might achieve that if he stays, uh, if, if, you know, if things continue on the trajectory that they're on. But that would be a big win for the Libertarian Party. Good point. In the back there. <laughs> so, will, yeah, will Gary Johnson's uh, gaffe of uh, where is Aleppo or what's Aleppo, um, will that have any impact on uh, the number of people voting for him? You know, I think it very well could. I, I mean, I think my sense is that a lot of people who support Johnson or Stein are doing it in reaction to Clinton and Trump, and they're saying there's got to be somebody better than Clinton and Trump. Uh, there's a third party candidate. I'm going to vote for them. So I'm not sure whether all of them have actually looked into Johnson 
and Stein very thoroughly. So uh, something like that, I, I think, is bound to hurt Johnson. Um, do you have anything to add? Only right? that, um, you know, if you're, if you're the Johnson-Weld campaign, you were fighting for every minute that you can get on TV. And when you spend your time on television defending, you know, or, or apologizing for not knowing where Aleppo was or what the situation was there, it's just not, um, it's not a good use of what is a very, you know, finite resource for them. Yeah, definitely. Um, yes? In past lectures, you talked about getting on all 50 states from the presidential election and that there were certain cutoff dates. Tonight you mentioned that the GOP could dump. There's a mechanism within the GOP to dump Trump as an October surprise. How would they get him on to the 50 states if that mechanism, or if the, the deadline is getting a name on, uh, were to change? So the question relates to um, uh, the fact that I made comments that the GOP could dump Trump. There's rules in the uh, Republican uh, National Committee that has a process for replacing a candidate. Um, and, and how does that tie in with the fact that, um, you know, a candidate needs to be on the ballot in all 50 states? How, how, does, how do those work together? I think it's a good question. I'm not sure I totally know the answer, but let me take a crack at it. And, and I think that the issue relates around the party being on the ballot. So, um, it's, it's the, so the Republican Party is on the ballot in all 50 states. The Libertarian Party... Um, I'm not sure if they're on the ballot in all 50 states right now. They will be, yeah. They, they will they're be. Last I heard, it was like 33 or 34. Uh, the, the Green Party is uh, 22 or 23 states. So it's a party basis. Um, but I don't know exactly that mechanism of uh, how the name gets changed and whether that's an issue or not. It's a good question. To follow up on that, then, if, if that were to happen, yeah. you know that Trump would not give it up. So then, would he be out of the 50 state, even though he's on now? I mean, how would, if the GOP says, oh, we want to put somebody else, would there be two GOP then per state? If the Republican Party um, exercised their option under their rules to replace Donald Trump on the ballot, um, he, there would not be two Republicans on the ballot. It would just be that replacement. Trump could run a write-in campaign. Uh, a number of states do permit write-in can candidacies. Some uh, prohibit write-in candidacies. Um, but like I said, I don't know the exact intricacies of how that would play out um, because that kind of thing has never happened. So, yeah. So, uh, yes. passed away, what do you think he'd have to say about Trump 30 years ahead using basically basically saying that? And, quick follow-up, the Russian hackers are probably going to do a big release of documents. That's probably going to be the October surprise. Why doesn't anyone think the Russians, the Chinese, or the North Koreans are going to hack our election? So the two questions, one is what would Lee Atwater think about uh, Donald Trump's overtly racist uh, comments? Um, I mean, Trump has gotten away with a lot of things that uh, nobody else ever has gotten away with, and that hasn't really impacted his uh, poll numbers. And one of the things that I think we have to remember is I, I think in, in some measure the rise of Donald Trump, uh, I would say, comes about because of two things. Um, one is the Republican Party stating uh, fairly specifically after Barack Obama's election that they were going to do everything possible to oppose anything that Obama wanted. That has resulted in gridlock in Washington, D.C., and people then say, Washington, D.C. is gridlocked. Um, we need to change. Well, it's the Republicans who kind of created that gridlock. And... Um, then the second thing that, that why we have the situation we do right now, I think, is a reaction against Barack Obama being the first black president. 
and, and so we've got a, um, there are some racist and sexist uh, overtones to this election. I think we've got uh, a, a, a segment of the population who says, um, you know, we had a black president for eight years, and now we're talking about a, uh, a white woman. Uh, and, and there is this segment of the population that, um, you know, doesn't want that. And, and so Donald Trump has spoken to that segment of the population and, and used words that, um, you know, nobody else has ever used. So the second part of your question related to uh, hacking and um, by, by Russia, China, and North, North Korea. And, and the question related to the election. And yeah, all these documents are being dumped about these elected officials and, and, or candidates. Yeah. I mean, we're knowing more. Now, we're going to know more now by the November 8th or whatever the date is. And we haven't heard that anyway. Right. So if they're doing all this hacking, why hasn't anyone brought up that our voting systems could be affected? Are we just too frightened to realize that? Or do we think about it? Well, I, I think the question has been raised about the integrity of the voting process from a hacking perspective. Uh, there were hacks into two state uh, election databases, Illinois and Arizona, I believe. Um, but one of the things that I think we have to remember, not that it's not possible that election systems get hacked and, and change the results of elections, but we have to remember that um, election databases in the United States are very decentralized. So it's very much state by state. Um, not to say that somebody couldn't do that on a state by state basis. Um, so. Could occur. We'll take uh, two more questions and um, and then we'll call it a night. I was wondering the most troubling thing to me about this election is kind of the perversion of truth. And I just wondered if in your lectures you'll maybe address that. I mean, we descended to a banana republic. What legitimacy has been given to this offensive <laughs> candidate? Um, and the way we even talk about him, right. we give him so much of a, so much stature, right. and he should be just condemned. Yeah, so the question relates to the, uh, the, the absence of truth um, in, in the election, um, and, and that is certainly true. And this, um, you know, somewhat goes back to my comment earlier about the false equivalencies that I, I think... That, yeah, that, that, that the media, I think, promotes in terms of trying to say, well, we have to treat the candidates equally. Well, I, I, I don't think that's true. I think we need to call a spade a spade, and, and, um, and, and it needs to be clear. But uh, we, we can, uh, that's a good idea. We'll try to address some additional things about truth. Of course, that could be a really long lecture, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, one more question, Barb. Can they do that again, or can yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. So, so Barb's question relates to: can, can we have fact checkers during? We'll pass it along. The yeah. debates. <laughs> we'll let them know uh, when we moderate the debates. We'll do that. Uh, I, yeah, I know. Sometimes they have a, a scrolling they thing at the bottom, yeah. and and I read something about that recently, and I thought they were going to do that, but I don't know for sure. But it would be nice because some pretty outlandish statements are made. And it, they, they just kind of get passed off as, okay, this is truth, but, but there's no basis. Yeah, it's hard. You know, the fact-checking fact checking is occurring <coughs> real time, but when it's not up on the TV screen, um, then it requires people then watch the out. event, then go online and fact-check or be fact-checking while the event is happening online. And we know that that's just, you know, there are, much, there are many more people who watch an event then who will then go and later fact check. And so that's why I think that you're right on that it's important if we're going to do that, that moderators fact check or that there's fact checking that is on the chirons, those little running crawls at the bottom of a screen. I think that just, that would be important. I'm just curious, what, what do you think are the best fact checking sites? Because anybody can get their political opinion, you know, oh, sure. I've seen PolitiFact used probably more than others in this election. Um, if there are other good ones, um, yeah. 
certainly send me an email and you know let me know what you are using. That one is one that I've seen, but almost um, you know most major news organizations also have them. Um, you know, and so so like CNN has a fact checking site. New York Times, I think, also does fact checking. Um, I think that they, you know, by and large, um, you know, you do have there, there are you know there is some dispute about what is a fact and what isn't a fact um, on these sites, unfortunately. Um, so, um, but I imagine if you're going to those sites and you're reading them, that you're sophisticated enough to try to you know kind of pull away the bias, see what's actually. Um, true there. But again, I think PolitiFact is the one that probably I've heard the most um, in this election. So Michael and I will stick around if you have any questions and hope to see you October 24th.